All right. Uh, so again, today, Alexis, uh, P oh boy, I'm going to murder this name, Lepitra. How's that? Okay. Uh, and she is an addiction and, and uh, an, an ED doctor. And she's going to talk a little bit today about OUD management in the acute care setting, which I suspect is going to be tons of fun. Um, Aaron is not here, so it's just me that everybody has to deal with today. All right, next slide. So remember, we got some upcoming sessions that are that are really pretty interesting. The uh, Pink Cloud Foundation Recovery Housing Assistance. This is mostly based in the metro, uh, but lots of interesting things we're going to be doing with uh, uh, Kate LePage, who is uh, the safe harbor for our sex trafficking group. So uh, she's going to come on a couple times. And as you all know, the Charlie Reznikov coming back again to to chat with us about the hot topics to addiction medicine. He's always a fun person. I think probably at the end of April, I'll be doing our, a talk on ADHD and substance use disorder patients, which uh, is kind of an interesting topic as well. So next slide. Um, remember there's free CME. Please make sure that you, you get that stuff from Katie and you send it back or you don't get it. And please, as you can see the arrow showing where you can turn your screen on so that we can see your charming faces, that would be great because I believe uh, Dr. Alexis would love to see faces from Minnesota since she's from New Jersey. So next slide, please. Uh, remember, if you need any help, please call. I'm at the addiction clinic here a few days a week and then I'm around or call Aaron. That's probably easier and quicker. Uh, and she can get hold of me if we if we need to talk. So uh, next slide. Um, and again, you can go to the website as well. All of the protocols, everything that we've done in communities, ERs, all kinds of places is in there, and you don't have to re, uh, reinvent that wheel. Next slide. Oh, and Dr. Janet Chestnut, who's on today, guess who got an award? I saw this in the MMA, and I thought, why didn't you tell us that you got the, the Humanitarian Award in 2023? So congratulations, Janet. I bet you were surprised to see your picture. So I am surprised. Thank you. It was all, certainly unexpected. Well, we're always watching you, so just be aware. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next slide. All right, so with no further ado, we'll let Dr. Alexis uh, maybe introduce herself, kind of tell her a little, tell a little bit about what she does. We'll let her share her screen and uh, look forward to a great talk. So thanks so much for uh, taking your time out from your busy life to kind of tell our people. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And congratulations, Janet. That is no small task. So that's just incredible. Um, I'm Alexis LaPietra. I did emergency medicine residency about 10 years ago and did a pain management fellowship after that. I focused the first couple of years of my career on opioid sparing strategies for pain in the emergency department, launched an opioid sparing protocol. It, um, it, it did pretty well. We got some money um, after Trump signed some legislation into effect. SAMHSA uh, gave us some money and that's the ED Alt grant now that's still going and very exciting. However, through all that work, I kept looking around in the ER, and yes, we were preventing opioid use disorder as we should, uh, prescribing judiciously, but still we need to prescribe opioids. But what about the patients that had opioid use disorder? And when I trained, um, there was no education. We rarely talked about it. Maybe someone got some Zofran, but we really, I, I nobody meant harm, but there certainly was harm and folks did not get the care they need. So we, the previous system I worked in, we launched ED buprenorphine in around 2018 and we launched it inpatient around 2020, 2021. Uh, people were excited to have something to latch onto, but no matter where I go, who I talk to, maybe except this group, um, people are not familiar with MOUD. And when people come into the hospital specifically, they often do not keep the bup, the buprenorphine on as a home med. They don't realize they can initiate methadone and they, they kind of let the patients flounder and suffer. So that's my focus is getting emergency medicine physicians and providers and hospitalist medicine physicians and providers aware of what OUD is, chronic medical disease, and we have medications to help. So we know the trajectory of this patient population. We know that they, oh, I should probably add that I, I'm addiction boarded also. I mean, 
just just for fun. Um, we know that the patients come in and they come out. They come in and they come out. And in emergency medicine and acute care, when people come in and they have an acute exacerbation of a chronic disease, there's high mortality associated with it. We keep them in the hospital. We provide them medication. We make sure that there's very little chance they'll come back. The goal is health, staying out of the ED, staying out of the hospital, and uh, living their best life. But this OED population clearly has a very high mortality, and we're looking in the eyes of OUD patients who have a chance of death 7.5% at one year when they receive naloxone, and we're giving them a piece of paper and you know, kind of saying good luck. So to know that this group has such a high mortality is the number one thing for us to remember because in emergency medicine and acute care, if they're not actively dying, if they're not a STEMI, they're not a stroke, they're not a bad asthma exacerbation, you know, our bar is, is different than other physicians in terms of what excites us or gets us worried. In emergency medicine, you know, it's the really heavy stuff that gets everybody running to bedside. It's the really high mortality things that get everybody excited. But this is a very high mortality condition. This person doesn't look like they're actively dying, but they are actively dying. And a 7.5% mortality at one year, if they came in after naloxone, is an unacceptable mortality for any other chronic medical disease that you would see. You would never send a patient home who had a 7.5% chance of death at one year after looking them in the face. Um, so this is this agitates me, I'm sure agitates a lot of you, is the mortality is um, not really talked about and really the phys physicians and providers don't know what to do with patients when they see them. We know it, that MOUD, is a very important intervention. And we know that if we can get folks started on MOUD when they're in the ED or the acute care setting, we can take all that mortality and drive it down to almost that of the general population. And there are so few things uh, in acute care where we can drive that mortality way down with a single intervention. Now, with advancing medicine, we have things, you know, um, putting stents in and doing cardiac cath instead of lytics. That was a big game changer. That drove mortality down. We have interventions for stroke. That's driving mortality down. This is a little film. This is a little tablet. And it's been around for over 20 years. This is not advanced technology. And it has such significant mortality. But we're not doing it. And when I talk to physicians, uh, you know, and they've never really heard about uh, how to treat OUD or MOUD, I try to bring up number needed to treat. We all want to practice evidence-based care, and we all know that there are things we are taught in training and things we keep up on through CME that are driven by evidence and quality. So when we look at that number needed to treat, of course, that's based on many studies and how many humans need that intervention for one good outcome. When we look at stroke patients, antiplatelets are given in acute care, that's just reflex. The number needed to treat is 40. So 40 people get antiplatelets. One person has a better outcome. We look at STEMI, people who have STEMIs, 42. Everyone gets aspirin for one good outcome because it's worth it. Asthma, Everybody who's having a moderate to severe asthma exacerbation certainly gets their steroids because of, for the nine people that get it, one patient will have a better outcome. So this is stuff that is reflexive. We don't think about it. And that's quality care. That's what we need to do. The number needed to treat for getting someone on to around 16 milligrams of bup daily is two. So it, there's no, there's nothing to argue. If we are if we desire to practice evidence based quality medicine, then we need to follow this science. Lower doses of bup have different number needed to treat, and the 16 milligrams or higher has just been shown that folks tend to have less illicit substances in their urine. They'll engage in treatment because their cravings are suppressed at a higher amount of buprenorphine. But this is just a massive I kind of a little bit of a slap in the face, I think, for a lot of physicians and providers, because we don't associate MOUD with this kind of mortality reduction. A lot of folks don't know how to pronounce buprenorphine. 
And I think this all comes down, I mean, we, not I think, it all comes down to lack of education, lack of understanding of what goes on neurobiologically in the brains of patients with substance use disorder. No one shows up, I hope, very few or to none, uh, providers show up to work and say, I'm not treating SUD patients today, or I'm not, I'm not comfortable treating SUD patients when they get admitted to the hospital. We are, we are, you know, we have to kind of be church not in a religious sense, but the hospital has to take everything. Come as you are. We'll take everything. And this is a big deal. SUD is a major issue that's that's not treated. So when we think about neurobiology, a lot of physicians and providers think, well, patients are just getting high. They're just using to get high. They're just having fun. You know, the first couple times folks use, yes, opioids do a very good job of spiking dopamine. That's what they're supposed to do. They're very good at their job. And that dopamine for some folks, based on genetics and other environmental factors, that will feel really good. That will feel like it solves a lot of what's going on. Other people vomit and, and they can't ever you know, pick it up or use again. Well, that dopamine, however, as people continue to use and use and use, it, it transfers into something different. It no longer goes to from euphoria and feeling good, we're having fun. It shifts into we're not having fun. And for many years in addiction, we couldn't understand why people couldn't stop. If you're telling me you're not having fun, if you're trying to stop every day, if you're waking up with all this shame and you're saying today's the day I'm not gonna use and then find yourself walking down the street to go get something, um, you know, why, why can't you just stop? We know love doesn't solve addiction. We know punitive measures don't stop addiction. Well, now we know it's a neurobiological disease and we know that despite harm, by definition, people are continuing to use. So what is that? That's not dopamine. That's not the neurotransmitter dopamine. So what we now know is there's an intense neurobiologic evolution that goes on after a person is exposed to high potency substances, specifically heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, cocaine, alcohol, over a period of time, the brain switches and neurobi new neurobiologic pathways emerge. The thing that you were doing every day for 10 years, getting in your car, driving to work, you, you didn't even know how you got get to work. You were off daydreaming, but your body knows how to do it. You know, those ruts change. And now you're waking up, you're walking down the street to go get some fentanyl. You don't even know how that happened. So something goes on in the brain and neurobiologically, there's a lot of changes. The research has showed that one piece of this, one, one responsible piece, is Delta FOSB splice variant. Delta FOSB is a transcription factor, and it starts to turn on all sorts of things in the brain. It starts to move around that neurocircuitry, so that paved pathway that you were walking on starts to kind of that that neurocircuit starts to atrophy, and all new neural circuits start to form. And this we now know contributes to to really the hijacking of the human with substance use disorder. A lot of this is glutaminergic and glutamate does play a role in that compulsive behavior. So it's not euphoria. It's not, I'm having fun. It's not dopamine. This is now neurobiologic changes. This is transcription factors being turned on and this is glutamate. The brain changes, to kind of talk about them uh, a little bit simplistically, the, the limbic system is our pleasure center. So that, of course, enjoys dopamine. It's a horse here because it's a wily beast. That part of our brain has helped us survive forever and ever. We need dopamine to survive. We need to have sex to procreate. We need to be with our tribe, our social connection that spikes our dopamine, and eating spikes our dopamine. So the pleasure center, the limbic system is such an important part of our survival of our species. But as we've evolved, we have this executive center. So our prefrontal cortex now really takes over much of our behavior. It's on the on our horse, we're holding the reins, we're trotting along, we're in control. We're making executive decisions. Our PFC starts to talk to anterior cingulate gyrus, which are really the brakes for behavior. And this whole negotiation goes on millions of times every single day. And then there's a motor function or there's not a motor function. But there's a lot that goes into whether or not I'm gonna stand up during my lecture, whether or not I'm gonna go and get a coffee. In a use disorder brain, 
What delta FOS B does is it starts to have this new inputs and this new neurocircuitry. So now this area of our brain, this limbic system, even though there, it's not pleasurable the use anymore, that starts to take over. That has a lot more input and that pathway to our executive functioning. So we are, at, are analyzing our behavior, our ability to stop behavior. That pathway starts to atrophy. The brakes are out of the car or the reins are gone. And now you have this circuit that goes really for motor, go, 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 compulsive activity, compulsive activity. And again, this goes on millions of times every single day. And this happens to uh, this happens to people with healthy brains all the time. We kind of fall off of this horse. So to empathize with substance use disorder patients, not to minimize their disease, but to think in our own brains, when we get into situations where we, we lose control and we're not ourselves and we don't know how we ended up there, this happens with high emotions, that the rider that's trotting along in control gets thrown off the horse. And you do things they usually have to apologize for. I acted out of anger. I wasn't in my right mind. You know, I couldn't see straight. I saw red. That is a very heightened state and you have no executive functioning at that time. But a lot of folks are able to get back on the horse. They get back on, prefrontal cortex comes back online, anterior cingulate gyrus helps with motor activity and you can stop. Substance use disorder patients are frequently off the horse and they're in these neurobiologic ruts that they cannot get out of despite the strong desire to do so. For opioids specifically, the locus ceruleus plays another really big role, and this may be what we see more of in the emergency department and the acute care setting. This has to do with the physiologic withdrawal. So that tiny little locus ceruleus in the brainstem is our fight or flight area. And this has a lot of mu receptors around it, and we have an inactivation of fight or flight when we have opioids in the system. So really when people are using every day, there's not that adrenergic surge, things are kind of you know more calm, but when opioids cease to be in the bloodstream, the locus ceruleus is not happy. And that is the sympathomimetic pathway that you see all the adrenergic surge, the hypertension, the tachycardia, the agitation, all of that is physiologic from the brainstem. And if you speak to people in recovery, it, mm. you know it's not fatal. It is horrible to go through. It is horrible. There is panic, sheer panic, suicidal ideation, and physical physical pain. Every time someone goes through withdrawal, there's a new heightened pain. And that comes from other parts of the brain. Each withdrawal is more and more and more painful. So you're in the hospital. You are going to go through withdrawal and you know it. They're not, we're, we're not providing bup. We're not providing methadone. Maybe we're giving a little clonidine. I mean, people bring drugs into the hospital with them because they need to be treated. That medical disease is, is going unrecognized. So we need to remember that when we have patients and we're not providing support, there's so much going on biologically that is unethical to not treat and so unfair. Of course, the patient is gonna leave against medical advice. They're not going to stay. And the last piece that I feel is important for this population is the medial orbital frontal cortex, which is, our, which is our social connection area. And we know a lot of folks with SUD have immense shame, and we know there is a ton of stigma. So when the social connection area gets disrupted, pa patients start to become more isolated. No longer do they have the positive reinforcement of their family, their community, their spouse, their um, children, that gets shut off with continued use. Now they only have that positive feeling, that sense of community when they're with the drug. So that neurobiologic shift is huge. You're no longer going home. You're no longer seeing your children. And really the only time you feel that connection is with the drug. So you're losing all your social connection. You're, you, you're losing yourself and your identity and the role you play in society, and you become very isolated. And that also causes immense shame and that perpetuates stigma. So when we say in the ER or the acute care setting, well, you're gonna be here with us for a little while. You, you can just stop using and you'll just, you'll muscle through it. It's a very ignorant statement. And again, I understand because we weren't taught.
So now that we know, now that we have this data, now that we know it's a neurobiologic issue and a massive physiologic issue with withdrawal, we can't say just stop. The suffering is immense. With illicit fentanyl, we also know the relapse is fatal. With periods of abstinence and relapse, that dose, that one time, can be, can be fatal. So we are dealing with a very potent, highly fatal drug. And when we just say stop and we don't offer some support or harm reduction during the healing process, we are dealing with a very risky situation. So remembering that using buprenorphine, using methadone when appropriate, it reduces suffering. The brain will recover. Recovery is possible in so many ways. And we have millions of people that are evident that, that show that evidence. Recovery is possible. The brain heals. But during that acute phase of recovery, the first year or two, or sometimes much longer, the suffering is so intense. And this is what the focus should be is protecting that patient, providing support and reducing harm. An analogy I like to use is a broken bone. So in the ER, if you have a femur fracture because you fell off your bicycle, we would say to you, I'm sorry, Ms. Smith, you have a femur fracture, but you will heal. If you stay off your bike, just say no to the bike, you will heal. And you'd say, oh, thank gosh, that's that's wonderful. Okay, well, now I'm ready to go. How do I get home? I don't know. Just don't go on your bike. But I have so much pain when I walk. It will heal, but not for six to eight weeks. Just don't go on your bike. So when we think about the suffering that we would never allow in other populations, uh, it's very alarming to think of what we allow in substance use disorder. For the femur fracture, there is no question that people would not provide crutches. You're not going to ride your bike anymore. You know that. You're going to heal. You know that. But you are in for a long six to eight weeks of suffering. And how are we supporting that human being during that healing process? What we advocate for in acute care is Suboxone, Subutex, any buprenorphine product. Buprenorphine comes in many different formulations. A lot of the folks that I deal with prefer the film, which means we're providing the buprenorphine and the naloxone combo product. We only have the mono product available in tablets. We, of course, have the combo available in tablets as well. But tucking that film in, having it dissolve quickly, especially in the ER or on the floor, getting them fast relief is important. So I let Providers know, I don't care which formulation patients want, but typically that film just dissolves easier. They can't tolerate it, we can switch them over to film. The naloxone doesn't matter. Naloxone is an abuse deterrent. I don't know why we don't have abuse deterrents in our Oxycontin, but there, there it is in buprenorphine for no good reason. Uh, and it's inert. When dissolved and absorbed sublingually, the naloxone plays very little role. Sometimes it affects some people long-term, but for acute care, we need them to feel better. We need them to get the film. We need it to dissolve. And so, so we do so much in acute care that's so dangerous, uh, but we're comfortable with that danger because we we did it in residency and we've, we've done it as attendings and it just becomes part of who we are. We're physicians, we're providers. We engage with risky medical issues all the time, but we're afraid of buprenorphine. The X waiver didn't help. They kind of shrouded it in mystery for a lot of folks. Like, I'm an ER doctor. Um, I paralyze people. I intubate people. I put tubes into people's chests. I crack chests open and massage the heart. But I never gave buprenorphine, nor did I know how to pronounce buprenorphine. So as physicians and providers, what we do is scary. But buprenorphine is not in of itself. It is just mysterious because we haven't learned. But once you learn, it's easy. It's safe. It's the safest opioid you'll ever give. It's partial agonism. It only activates the receptor about 50%. You do not have dose-dependent respiratory depression, which you have with every full agonist. There's not massive spikes of dopamine. So people tend to not have gross euphoria, in a patient population that has been abstinent from all opioids for a period of time, and you would consider opiate naive, if they put a bunch of bup under their tongue, they would get a little bump. But in New Jersey, bup is $15 a film, and fentanyl is $2 a bag. So we tend to have folks not 
diverting and using VU for a buzz. Uh, they tend to be able to have access, unfortunately, to fentanyl. So that really shouldn't be a deterrent for anyone. And then the high affinity is so beautiful. So again, that you know, 16 milligrams or higher we're seeing is probably best in early recovery, although of course that varies by practice and hospital but it gets on that receptor and it's not coming off. So if folks choose to use while bup is in their system, they tend not to overdose and die. And that is a win. The downside to high affinity, of course, is precipitated withdrawal, which is a major fear for the OUD population. And in case this is new information to anyone, the analogy that I use for the high affinity partial agonism, it's like Niagara Falls coming down, you have all this fentanyl in your brain, full agonist all day, all this fentanyl, activates 100%. If we give bup with all that fentanyl on the receptors, you're gonna knock it off and you're gonna go down to 50% activation. It is perceived as a withdrawal. And it is not a small withdrawal. Buprenorphine precipitated withdrawal is horrible. It feels terrible. Patients are vomiting, they have diarrhea. So we really wanna avoid it. Sometimes we can't, but we really wanna know how to use bup properly in the acute care setting. We wanna know what scales we are required in order to drive our clinical care. And that starting it is totally safe. We just need to do it the right way. Traditionally, of course, we've used the clinical opioid withdrawal scale. In the 12 hospital system I'm in now, none of the inpatient nurses knew what a cows was. They know what CWA is, and that's good. We need to know about CWA. Um, but opioids have been around, I think, longer than alcohol. And so we should, we should really know what a cows is. So this is a huge system issue. It's not only providers, it's pharmacy, it's IT, it's nursing, it's everyone. So getting these scales into the EMR, printing them out on paper, whatever we need, we have to help folks understand that we have a scale. We have our glucometer and we titrate insulin. I don't care how much insulin a patient needs. I wanna make sure that they're feeling better and, and their numbers are better. And when we use the cow score, it's not perfect. It has a lot of subjectivity, but it certainly allows us a starting point and then a, a, a delta for a change so we can use it to track. Ideally with fentanyl, we are really looking for objective symptoms and we are also trying to have that, that patient be about 24 hours from last use if we can to make sure again that high potency lipophilic fentanyl is out. So um, Kurt told me that you guys definitely have fentanyl all around. Um, we know it's caused issues. We know patients precipitate um, more so than with heroin, which is water soluble. And it's really become very frustrating for patients, become a barrier to getting them on safe buprenorphine that's prescribed. They don't have to go every day to an OTP. Bup is nice, can be integrated into family medicine, frustrating for physicians as well. In the acute care setting, the conversation has to change. So when folks are in the ER, it's not, well, you're not in withdrawal, I can't help you. No, 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 no. If you had someone with a medical issue and you happen to get a CMP and their blood sugar was 590, you would not let them go. You would say, okay, well, we, we have a secondary issue here. It's not, well, I don't know, you don't have DKA, so I'm just going to treat you for your pneumonia. No, no, no. Once we identify a high risk condition, we have to treat it. So if patients come in for abscesses, for fractures, for whatever, and we find out through screening, disclosure, conversation that they have OUD, that initiates a secondary conversation. I wanna help you. Here are some options for you. We could talk about methadone pros and cons. We could talk about bup pros and cons. You may not need it right now in the ER. Let's talk about when you last used. This has to be normalized. When we, when we talk about stroke, last known normal, last known normal, it's drilled, it's drilled, it's drilled. This needs to be drilled too. It's okay to talk to people about their drug use. They're using, and the more we keep it quiet, the more shameful it becomes. No, it's part of their chronic condition, and we're going to talk about it. And we say, either we're going to start you here now, or I'm going to give you the tools to start at home. And ideally, there would be support around that discharge with either peer recovery or outpatient community stakeholders or organizations that would be able to provide case management, et cetera. Even if there's not, even if the patient says, doc, I don't really think I'm gonna use that, my practice is to still send it because we know at 2 a.m. when something switches and that person wants to be well, their ability to get bup is not easy. 
So if we have a few films that they can they can keep around, they start to feel withdrawal. Any bup in the body is better at any time. It makes them feel like humans. It lifts that veil a little bit. So if I can't start it in the ER, we do a home induction. They get symptomatic medications to carry them over. We talk about what a, you know, a layperson's cows, although this population is very savvy, very medically literate. And we make sure that they have what they need when they go. So this is kind of our algorithm. Um, I know a lot of us have our own algorithms, but we're looking at uh, cows of around eight, 24 hours since last use, objective signs of withdrawal. You know, if they have that, good, we can dose. That's kind of easy. If they don't have those that criteria, they get a script, they get symptomatic meds, and they get an naloxone kit. So we're really kind of wrapping around trying to make sure they have everything in their hand. Uh, we have 24-7 peer recovery in all 12 of our hospitals. Huge. It's all grant funded. So they engage bedside with the patient and they provide a lot of follow-up and there's navigation services for that patient as well. A lot of people are um, very nervous about bup precipitated withdrawal, so we have to make sure we talk about this. The treatment is more bup. This has to be part of our algorithm. And now we're seeing a lot of xylazine in the Northeast, which is called TRANK. So it's a veterinary tranquilizer, causes significant prolonged sedation, also causes all of these crazy wounds. So we have now protocols for treating that because it is no longer just opioids when, we, when they go through withdrawal. We really have 90% of our samples are xylazine. So this is just an example that when we're using bup and we're employ, you know, employing MOUD, if someone's not quite getting better, things are not lining up, we have to screen that they're doing everything okay, but then consider some of these adulterants. And xylazine has a withdrawal. It is profound in that the agitation is exquisite, lots of tachycardia, and these are symptomatic meds. Nothing crazy to start here. The goal is to keep people comfortable and healthy. And then my... I'm advocating, I'd like to advocate any recovery support that's available, a peer-to-peer, -peer, just like a doc-to-doc, nurse-to-nurse, peer-to-peer is always the best conversation. So if there's peer recovery services anywhere near you, that is the engagement that's most necessary because that is the human that really knows what's going on. And we want to be supportive of that, but we're playing our medical role. We also need an empathetic human role to be filled as well. So in acute care, ER or inpatient setting, it's our job. It's our job to recognize and treat it. It's not going away no matter how much MOUD we give. I hope the mortality comes down, but it's not going away. People will always be using substances. We will always see SUD like we have seen historically as long as humans existed. So we've got to recognize it. We can treat it if withdrawal is present. We can give bup. If it's not present, then we do not ignore it. It has to be treated, bup has to be given, it's a safe medication to prescribe, and it should be prescribed, no more waiver. And then again, just trying to have empathetic connections, wherever that is in your community, peer or recovery centers, there needs to be human connection and there needs to be social connection for these folks as well. And that's it. All right. I suspect we have a few questions. Anybody want to unmute and ask questions or I will throw some of mine out there. No one has immediate questions. I, you know, one of the interesting things I think that um, that has kind of interested me and you talked a little bit about lack of education. And, and when we think about COVID for a moment, how quickly everybody got up to speed on COVID, right? And so I'm wondering what you think about not only the lack of education, but maybe the and, and this isn't for this group because this group act is clearly here, but there is a large percentage that do not. It's not that they're not educated. They really don't want the education for this. They don't want to do this in their practice. Right. I want to get comments on that. Sure. Uh, it's we, we know it's stigma. Um, you know, I want, I listened to a podcast a while back when I was getting into addiction and it was talking about how contagious shame is and the avoidance of shame. So, um, for physicians and providers, you know, there's a lot of shame that patient population because they're sick tend to be difficult. They can be agitated. They can be a little combative, especially, you know, in the emergency department, um, they are humans, 
they are humans. And we have to remember, if you've ever seen somebody in recovery, they'll tell you what they looked like when they were sick. But there's a human tucked into the mess. We're all messes. We just hide it better. So there's a human tucked into the mess of SUD. And we, if, if you're in medicine, you're not allowed to dislike humans. Unfortunately, you signed up to treat all of humanity, the good, the bad, the ugly. So I, I really, I'm a little, I get a little bit frustrated. I said, guys, you're treating all of the repeat customers, all of our friendly faces who come in, DKA, non-compliant end stage renal disease, not going in hemodialysis. And you kind of do it with a smile. We kind of joke, we high five, we know these people's names. How dare you, because of a disease that you just don't know about, how dare you judge? So I think it, it comes down to holding up a mirror for those providers and physicians so they truly understand the statement they're making when they opt out of caring for the population. And the last piece, the podcast piece is, the person was saying, from an evolutionary standpoint, when we had to rely on our community and our tribe to survive, if someone wasn't pulling their weight, if someone was sickly, if someone was what, I don't know, misbehaving, they, they kind of were left. They were left because they weren't able to advance that, that tribe forward. So there is this idea that we're evolutionarily, we're looking at these folks like, Ugh, they did it to themselves. Um, it's their fault. They are not contributing to society. We are just going to leave them. They can figure it out. But of course, we know that's not true. <laughs> yeah. There's a question about where can I find uh, home inductions in, in home induction instructions. That's hard to say to give to the patient, um, which there's probably a million different ways to do. If you want to comment on that, everybody's got their way, right? Yeah, yeah. There's um, Yale. I mean, I'd be happy to send you mine. Uh, Yale has one. Uh, Dr. Ruben Strayer uh, on EM updates. I can type it in the chat. Uh, he has one as well. ASEP has a bunch. So any kind of site that, um, you know, if you type in um, buprenorphine home induction, you'll get a few hits. Um, and I'd be happy to share mine. It's adapted from all the stuff that's out there. Yeah. I think one of the, and you know, one, one of the things that I always tell people that ask me that is that um, you can never be sure exactly how people will take it. And so you want your instructions to be as as clear as they can be, because um, often I think we all think this way, more is better, right? So, uh, and that's what happens. I, I get people who take too much and uh, despite the fact it's all been written down. So just be sure that you're very clear. Um, but you know, I, there's so many uh, different ways people do it. Um, there's a question about uh, what can we do in the field to make MAP mainstream? How do we make it mainstream? In the field of uh, just medicine? Yes. Um, I, what they mean. I, I think that it has to be, I know it's, I know we've been talking about the opioid epidemic now for a long time. And I think people have a little bit of opioid epidemic fatigue. Like we get email fatigue. It's like a constant conversation, but it's not. Until, for example, I, I was saying to Kurt, um, the senior VP for all 12 emergency departments took sepsis away from the end of year physician quality incentive. So some money that you get at the end of the year if you keep up to date on quality metrics, things that are important like sepsis. He took sepsis off because guess what? We know how to treat sepsis. And he put MOUD on. All naloxone reverse patient, well, not all, but uh, we have 25 to start and then 50 is our goal. 25, 50% of naloxone reverse patients would get buprenorphine, of course, when clinically appropriated. They, we don't need to be giving it out just to give it out. Uh, we went from 11 scripts, after, you know, about 18,000 consults to over 1,800 scripts in six months with the incentive. So we have to, how do we get it in the field? Understand how people change. What makes physicians, providers, nurses actually change practice? COVID did, Kurt, you're right, because everyone was dying. But the opioid epidemic, everyone is dying too. So talking about shame, stigma, holding up a mirror to the field of medicine to show them how they've been treating these human beings. By the way, a lot of us have family members who are those human beings. So there's holding up a mirror, there's incentivizing. Um, I think it just still needs to be talked about and prioritized. 
from the top down of every healthcare system or you know managing team in ambulatory and from our professional societies. Um, but I think, I don't know, incentives seem to work. I know it's not easy for everyone, but we can't stop talking about it. We have to be loud and we have to be realistic and transparent about the behavior of our medical community in the United States. Yeah, and I think too, one of the big things that needs to be addressed is what's going on in jails. I suspect you've dealt with that some in the ED and um, and we do frequently because if we don't if we don't fix that problem there, you know we we can't otherwise grab onto those patients, right? Sure, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. MOUD diversion programs, uh, absolutely. We have to treat it as a medical disease. It can't all just be punitive. You know, punitive. Got to get them help and support. I agree. Yeah, Cody asked the question, are there any good materials available online that could help inform or advocate locally on this? Hmm. You know, so there's a lot of harm reduction stuff through the Harm Reduction Coalition, the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, being a national organization, of course, they have different branches. They've done a, a good job, of course. Um, how do we get harm reduction discussions into practice, into our community? And I, I believe, you know, MOUD is a harm reduction intervention. I know there's ASAM levels of care, but there's also people who uh, don't fit those levels of care. And until we make post MI patients go to the gym at least an hour a week to give them their meds, I don't believe we have successfully addressed all the patients in the ASEM level of care because, of course, even with OP, they have to go to counseling and we all need counseling. We really all, if you have a brain in 2024, you need counseling, but you're allowed to choose when you do that. So I think low barrier access and those the harm reduction coalitions talk about things like that. So just getting BUP in bodies continued health engagement, the harm reduction community is comfortable talking about that. Um, it's a little bit polarizing, but that's a great option. Um, the American College of Emergency Physicians for any ED docs or um, really, I guess any ED docs uh, and providers, they have a lot. There's a whole section of the college dedicated to this. There's a lot of materials through ASAP, uh, AAFP. Um, but I think you have to find your community stakeholders. And I think the harm reduction folks are, are pretty cool and really flexible and they know how to talk about tough stuff. Yeah. You know, here in Minnesota, of course, we have the Steve Rumler Foundation and they do so much. And and just if you're not familiar with those, uh, please check their website out. You can get free test strips from them, free Narcan, all kinds of things. They'll come do trainings in your community uh, for free. So uh, please, uh, think about them if you need somebody. So, um, you know, it, one thing that I just wanted you to maybe expand on, too, I think it's really interesting. You talked about, you know, the importance of connection and, and how really the only connection left often is is the substance that they're using. And you've probably heard this as well as I have, where I have patients who've come in a month after they've stopped uh, using and saying, I feel like my brother died. Um, I mean, it's really striking, wouldn't you say? Yes, uh, I, I agree. It's it's almost, you know, what I think is most difficult as for physicians and providers is the empathy you know, empathy, imagining what it's like, being able to imagine being in your shoes. So when someone comes in and they haven't used and they say something like that and you think, oh, my gosh, if my brother died, like that, that is that is heavy. That's that's if that doesn't carry the gravity, it should. Then, then you're not listening. So the empathy is so important because that that's neurobiologic. That's medical. So they're telling you their brain you know, their medical illness is so profound. That's what it feels like. So I think um, one issue is reintegrating them and connecting them again. What are the things they like to do? How can they find, you know, quote unquote, their new brother? Um, but it's it's so profound. Um, someone, I, I think, had to do some chores for a church group and uh, someone called him to thank him for doing the chores. He was a clinic patient and he came in and he cried. He said, no one's thanked me for doing anything in about 10 years. And all I did was drop off some groceries. And that just made my day because it means I'm worth something. And I was pretty sure I wasn't worth anything. So the social yeah. connection is pretty, pretty big. Yeah, there was a comment about addressing grief uh, regarding loss of substance. fairly common in 12-step programs and in SMART. And yes, that's true. That's good comment. 
Any other questions that anybody has before we let Alexis get back to her day? Um, one other note in there. How can we present buprenorphine as a more scientific patient-centered means to recovery versus abstinence-based treatment to ED staff and providers? Now that's a that's a great, great question. The million dollar question. Um I think one so I, I use HIV AIDS as an example. When it started, immense stigma, no real medical knowledge, everyone ran away, no one was running towards these patients. Um, and you know the momentum it ultimately got, the funding it ultimately got, the science that came from it, and of course the treatment, and now it is no longer a fatal disease. What I, I think the difference there is the everyone was on board that it needed to be treated, and, and we were all rowing in the same direction. Right now, there is a group, and, and it's okay, everybody's allowed to, this is just my opinion, the, the abstinence-based folks have to uh, just get a little more flexible because of the death and because of the potency of fentanyl to not allow MOUD in NA meetings. Um, every road to recovery is a, is a right road, but I want patients to have an inf make an informed decision. I want patients to know the science behind being on MOUD in early recovery and not. There's a 90% relapse rate, and with the fentanyl potency, there is a very high risk of death. So I understand 10 years ago, you know, I, I have a lot of friends in recovery, and I work with 120 peers. Many of them did abstinence-based 12-step, and here I come. Uh, and it, it took a lot of, you know, everybody is very connected to their own recovery. It's so personal. It's so meaningful. So it can't be a knock against their recovery. It has to be an evolution in the field. So physicians and nurses are having their own hard time, but behavioral health and the recovery community, it's also polarized over here. So we have two groups where this thing is polarized. Although evidence-based and scientific, the docs and nurses didn't learn about it, so we're battling uphill. But the behavioral health community and the recovery community is not even 100% behind it. So it, with HIV AIDS, postpartum depression, it was about recognition, putting resources, rowing in the same direction, and focused on treatment and prevention of death. We have to get everybody in the same boat. And it's uncomfortable because it's personal. But we have to just be rowing in the same direction. So, we, so talking, we do a lot of talking, a lot of empathy, a lot of discussions. Mm. There's a, there's an interesting question. Uh, has dropping the waiver made a difference in the number of providers prescribing the pupe? I'm interested to see what you think, because I know how I feel. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> no, because, because now um, they still don't know it. They still can't pronounce it. It's still shrouded in mystery and nobody taught them how to use it. So the eight hour requirement, you know, the attestation you need when you renew your DEA, um, that's a good, it's a good maybe first step, but no. I agree with you, Kurt. Like, so what? Yeah. <laughs> she said, Abby just said, I find most people don't know they don't need a waiver. I get that all the time. Can you see the patient right now? Because I can't prescribe buprenorphine. And I'll say, no, you can actually. And yeah. I'm going to you how to do it right here. I got you on the phone. So um, <laughs> they call me with the patient. I'm going to teach you how to do it right there. So um, so that is a big thing. And I, I do think we've had we've had more people prescribe it but the educate they have not a lot of them are doing it without the, the education right they uh especially with fentanyl it, it's been kind of dicey um, absolutely yeah and i don't know that you i don't know if you want to comment on like the micro or excuse me more low dose and macro dosing and i depending on the situation will do either but uh people are pretty afraid of doing a macro dose in a in a clinic um you know i'm fortunate to have a a place where I can premedicate people with things and and do all this, but most people don't, and so you know they're they're like, well, I can't do it in my clinic. I, it just won't work. Oh, well, so I'm 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 macro dose all day and all night. So Andrew Herring and I, you know, have he's been doing it longer than I. But when we started talking about this so many years ago at ASAP, um, we know that it was these small doses, and so so happy that he put some research out there that the 16 milligram loading dose. No issue. It's like, why would we not want to get this person feeling better quicker? Partial agonism, get it on as many receptors as possible. What is the harm? 
There are studies that show up to 96 milligrams in a single dose, not that we're gonna do that. And there weren't great, great studies, but there were studies where human beings got 96 milligrams you know, in a dose and there's a little hypotension in one and someone vomited in, in the other. So, um, and so not to be flippant, but in the acute care setting, uh, you have no excuse not to macro dose because they're there with you and they're monitored. In the outpatient setting, I find patients don't want to do the prolonged microdosing. They kind of want to get it over with, but it's hard to get to that point. I also explain lower doses. That's where you precipitate. So, you know, we got to get over the precipitation percent occupancy and we got to get over into the treatment. So if we give four or eight, there's a chance that we flick off just enough fentanyl to precipitate. But if we give 16, we land on the other side and we don't precipitate. And what is the harm? What, what literally, what, what is the harm? Can't overdose, can't become apneic. You just, you can't, you don't, you don't have euphoria or buzz if they're actively using. Yeah. Um, now, so I use that micro dosing for um, for pain patients who are transitioning from opioids onto bup or who need opioids for pain after trauma. So I love micro dosing, but for OUD, you just got to get it done. I, I find that if I have patients who precipitated themselves, they yeah. they do not want a macro dose. Um, they want to go slow, and they're willing to take a couple, two, three days where they're not going to be perfect. Uh, but they, I, and you see that with some frequency where they take a buddy's, you know, four and, you know, here we go. Yes. So, oh, it's terrible. And, and, and that's why it's case by case. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. We got a patient centered. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? Lowest cow score to macro dose. Interesting question. I'm just going to let you have that one. We were just, uh, I was just on an ASAP call with um, Gail D'Onofrio and Andrew and Strayer and a lot of these leaders because we want to put out a guide on this. And there were 10 of us on the call and there were 10 different cow scores. And, you know, Scott Weiner, um, he had said, we want to make this easy. We're telling everybody it's easy, but then you get 10 people on a call and none of us agree, which that messaging means it's hard. So, the lowest cow score is another million dollar question. What we know is that the cow score is not perfect. There's a lot of subjectivity, fentanyl is lipophilic and lingers. So we know the longer we can wait, the better. And we know we really need objective signs. So a cows of eight, it, a cows of eight may not have objective signs, cows of 12, 13, 14. So I don't use the cows as much anymore as I look for objective, objective signs. And uh, the subjective stuff I treat symptomatically. So that's that's my practice. You know, it, uh, it's honestly you, you just take the words right out of my mouth because I do think every patient situation is so different when they last use. How many of these fake Percocet are they taking? Are they using powder or not? You know, are they on a benzo? What do their pupils mm -hmm. look like? And so for me, it's always their pupils and their pulse. And then I kind of go, mm, you know, and and I it, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that you had ten people with ten different cows because, uh, you know, people will call me that and they'll say, well, they have a cows of twelve, and I say, well, what do their pupils look like? What's their pulse? And and man, I love it if they say their pulse is one hundred and ten. I mean, that just makes my day. Um, and so I I do think everybody's looking for that one thing, and I think there will be that one thing that right you're working on to put out. But we always have to ask a lot of questions, really. Clinical so. judgment. I know we love algorithms. And when we're learning new things, we just devour algorithms as, as with COVID, you know, follow for all the Paxlovid and everything. But unfortunately, humans don't follow algorithms. So we'll, you know, I, I get, I'll say, I'll give you a little guidance, but you got to have a little clinical gestalt. And I love your pulse and pupils with the alliteration there because people can remember that, Kurt. So I'm going to steal that. Pulse and pupils. Um, I yeah. say that in my clinic every day. Every I, I just know what their pulse and their pupils are. Just, you know. <laughs> and then my first question to them is, are you taking a benzo? Or did you use meth? You know, what else did you use that could make your pupils a little confusing to me? So it, it is. It's very interesting. It's fun. This is the best job in the world. Amen. I agree. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time today, Alexis. I, I couldn't, I, this was a fabulous talk. I really enjoyed it. And I think everybody else did as well by what the comments we've had. So thank you so much for, for everything you do and your time. Uh, just fabulous.
Oh, thanks guys for the venue and the forum and letting me squawk and uh, feeling in good company. So I appreciate it. All right. All right, everybody. We'll be back next week. And if there's any questions, please reach out to Katie or myself. Again, thanks to Dr. Alexa's fabulous talk. And someday we'll have her back down the road again. She, she must have a lot of things going. So, all right. Take care. Thank you.